Good morning. Let's see if we can get this show and party started today. This is Kira Gaunt, Dr. Gaunt, from my home studio. And I'm here to say hello, YouTube, as my students begin another semester of about 10 blogs, one a week, learning about the YouTube community by immersing ourselves in the first-hand personal study of a local setting that is quite complicated and complex YouTube. So one of the settings is here in my apartment here uh, in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, uh, New York City, the United States. Um, think about all the qualifiers I need to put in because someone could watch this video from Papua New Guinea or from the tip of Argentina. So um, I want to remind you of a few things about the course and about ethnography. Um, I'm noticing something. Here's a participant observational moment. That it's very difficult to keep attention from week to week, from chapter to chapter, which is why I invite you to bring your notes and uh, your questions and review them before you enter each new chapter. As you can see, we're like bombarded. We're in a, an intention distraction factory of our mobile devices, our uh, various websites we visit, my email, my email on my phone, uh, the five classes you may have, or the three classes that I teach. Like when I get an email from someone, I don't remember the context of what we were talking about. So context collapse is a very important context to think about, not just online today, but in life. We're always missing the cue from which um, a communication is being delivered, and we miss the context of the content we learn from week to week without re-establishing the context for our mind, um, our body, and our relationship to the texts and the people that we're supposed to be studying and understanding. So I want to remind you of some definitions. This, um, maybe about four, three or four years ago, um, I used to make my students do a deep analysis of the word ethnography, and I've been trying to parse it out at the beginning of each of the analyses that my students have been watching, you guys have been watching, uh, not watching, reading, um, from um, Eating Christmas in the Kalahari Desert by Richard Borchet Lee to Death Without Weeping by Nancy Sherper Hughes to um, The Body Ritual of the Nakurema, which we just read. Um, I'm going to put a link down in the doobly-doo, down below, um, which is um, a YouTube video I found of where I surmise that Richard, uh, that uh, Horace Minor, the author of Body Ritual Among the Nakarema, Nas 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 got this whole idea and never gave it credit. And I'm always emphasizing, like I say in the learning outcomes for the course, that you can you consistently use credible academic sources and you cite those sources using an APA style. If you go to APA. Uh, on the web, if you go to www.apastyle.org, it'll show you ways to cite everything from in-text uh, in citations, ebooks, interviews, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and other sources that you encounter online and off. Your job is to let me know how that information was created, in what form, and in most cases when it comes to academic work, that work was made through scholarship or through written scholarship in a journal or perhaps written on a blog, or in our case, since we're studying YouTube, in a video, and you need to cite all of those things. So um, I'm bouncing around here a bit. So I used to have my students do these in-depth ethnography definitions, and here are some of their, uh, some of the, oh, this isn't the one, but here are some definitions of ethnography. We present important truths about cultural situations, and that's why we use thick description thick descriptive detail to help us understand where we are, what's going on, who's saying what, so that we can start with the people and the communities and study both people and structures of power in a global scope. 
Um, ethnography relates to the specific observable behavior and how those behaviors connect to cultural norms that outsiders can't see, like in the body ritual among the Nakarima. Horace Minor wrote a satire. Now, what is a satire? A satire, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is the use of humor, irony, exaggeration, or ridicule to expose and criti criticize people's stupidity or vices, particularly in the context of contemporary politics or other topical issues. An example in a sentence is, the crude satire seems to be directed at the fashionable protest singers of the time. Well, in this case, Horace Minor was putting together what might be considered a crude satire of the way the colonial European empire of anthropologists in the beginning in the 19th century wrote about cultures they didn't fully understand. And what if we took that same lens and applied it to studying American culture or the body ritual among the Nakarema, Americans spelled backwards. So if we did that, we'd notice a few things when we're analyzing the text. It's a short, short essay, really. Um, the body ritual among the Nakarema, uh, just for people who might be catching this video, I'll read just a paragraph of it. The ritual of the Nakarema was first brought to the attention of anthropologists 20 years ago. So this was written in 1956, so we're talking about in the 1930s, um, in the late 1930s. Right? Uh, they are a North American group, it reads, living in the territory between the Canadian Cree, the Yaqui and the Tarama, uh, Tarahumara of Mexico, and the Carib and Arawak of the Antilles. Well, he's using language that's local to these particular um, localities, but not common in American discourse, in U.S. American contemporary 2015 or 1956 discourse. We would have said that it was a North American group living in the territory between Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean. Instead, he says the Canadian Cree and mentions people that we wouldn't recognize, the Yaqui and Tarahumaro of Mexico, and the Carib and Arawak of the Antilles. What's great is that because of the increased migration in the United States, a lot of students probably would recognize Cree as a Native American group or the Carib or the Arawak of the Caribbean, but wouldn't put it all together because it's kind of like a fish out of water. The contexts are collapsed in the discourse so that they disorient you from understanding that we're talking about American cultures, um, highly developed market economy, which re it reads, that has evolved in a rich natural habitat of human beings and, and environments, which much of the people's time is devoted to economic pursuits, the love of money, and a considerable portion of their day is spent in ritual activity. The focus of this activity is the human body, the appearance and the health of which appear as a major concern in the people's belief. Now, if you're an outsider of American culture and you come in for the first time and you see what we do in our grand tour of our day, the first thing is we do is we go to this ritual act of bowing to a porcelain font and a mirror in the front of us, which if you were observing it from outside, might look like praying if you didn't know any better. And so Horace Minor does a really great job at trying to give us uh, an insight into the way that the European colonialists who were looking at non-Western cultures made them into what we now perceive as third world countries, people who are so different than us, despite the fact that in chapter six we read about that there's 99.9% .9 of DNA that we all share no matter what we look like. Our phenotypical features, as one student put, is uh, imagined. No, it is not. It is not imagined, it's real. This black skin is perceived as real to anybody who's not black and who's black. Um, but the DNA we share is practically the same. So we're the same species. Um, so a basic principle of ethnography is holism, right? We study culture, history, biology, and language in a global scope, studying people and communities to examine the context of their structures of 
um, power. And so, so to some degree, things and events must be understood in their social and cultural, if not also political context. And from this principle of holism comes a related dicta, um, this paradigm that we study whole bodies, whole people, whole interactions, and whole acts. What Horace Minor did was abstract things so that you were disoriented, so you couldn't understand the whole complexity of the community of American society. So, in the doobly-doo, I'll include a video from a local historian today in uh, the last five or six years, I think, uploaded to YouTube, from Detroit, an African-American historian who showed that there was a club in Detroit called the Nakarima Club, and it was developed in the early 30s because African-Americans weren't allowed to socialize with the white social clubs in the area in Detroit. So they took a local house and turned it into a club for African Americans. And yet, Norval Horse Minor doesn't even mention that this idea came from the African American community of Detroit. He was teaching at the University of Michigan. And how I discovered that is that in his bio, um, he got the same grant that I got when I was in my dissertation period in the late 90s, uh, the Horace B. Rackham Fellowship. And I was like, uh, in a lot of his bio, bio, he only mentions that he taught at Harvard, of course. Why would he mention that he taught at Michigan back then? Probably wasn't as big a deal. Um, but he did teach it at Michigan, and he probably lived in Detroit. And he probably became aware of this little uh, ponderability, ponderability of that this black subculture, or what we call co-cultures today, came up with this novel idea of writing American backwards. Well, as we continue with the Black Lives Matter campaign in 2015, the way that African Americans experience American culture feels backwards a lot. So it's really interesting to see that. And so uh, when you do your analysis and review of the body ritual among the Nisirama, remember that um, it's Horace Minor's satire that makes this so profound and why we continue to use an article from 1956. It's the ignorant observers and misinterpretation of American culture um, that he is modeling through his writing is brilliant. Um, just the way a colonialist believed that non-Europeans were uncivilized. One of the students in my Friday section said when she read it, it felt like she was reading about a third world country, not about America, the number one country in the world, the superpower, and all of those kinds of things. So it's really interesting how language shapes thought. Lyra Boroditsky's main point of her research demonstrating how language orients and disorients us. So the language we use to describe one another, the language we use to describe people around us, and particularly people in written texts, matters. And it's our responsibility, our ethical responsibility and duty to make sure that we don't misrepresent the naturalness, the complexity, and the meaningfulness of cultures from the insider, the emic perspective of a culture. And we use etic terms, the language of, of uh, anthropology that's been developed, for example, in chapter six, we use the language of, um, hold on one second, let me get my notes, of racism, which is described as a flawed classification. So it's a mental map of reality that's based on a flawed system of classification. Um, and it has no biological basis, and it uses certain physical characteristics to divide the human population into supposedly discrete groups. And when we use individual thoughts and actions or institutional patterns and practices that create unequal access to power, resources, and opportunities, even Horace Minor writing about uh, the Nakarema and not giving credit to what is probably the source of his idea, the African-American community's segregation in Detroit. Um, when we create unequal access to power or represent unequal access to power and resources and opportunities, 
based on the fact that we don't think that they should be included in a citation, that's called racism. It's based on a a aspects of our physical form or our genotypes and our phenotypes, the way genes are expressed in an organism's physical form that have no basis in the difference between you and me, between a white woman and a black woman, between a black man and a Polynesian man, between a man and a woman, except for our differences in genitals and sex organs and hormones. Um, and it's the practice of colonialism that set all of this stuff in place, the practice by which a nation state extend, extended political, economic, and military power, and I would also say intellectual power through the power of the pen and who got to publish what and, and where, um, that can even be seen inside of the way we broadcast on YouTube. And that's why I'm interested in our project studying the... Um, the way in which our broadcasts still carry the history and memory of racism and sexism in the way that we listen and filter, the way that we hear and think about what we see when we watch YouTube videos by people of color, by women, by white people, and what we think that translates into a mental map of reality. White supremacy is alive and well on the Internet. Um, white supremacy, the belief that, and it really is the inherent bias that comes with a belief that whites are biologically different, superior to whites, to other uh, races, that um, people who have straighter hair and less kinky hair get better access to jobs, people whose names are not Shaquandra, Yoshimbra, um, these are all real names of people who've been in my classes. Um, Anthony um, can only maybe play ba basketball, but they can't be CEOs or they can't be the directors of the marketing campaign or other ways in which we, which language shapes thought and biases us from our internal ethnocentrism that's causing the problem. We each have to be responsible for the ethnocentrism we bring to reading texts, to assuming we know who's writing, to assuming we understand the words that we're reading, and to not step back and really critically analyze how we are supposed to believe the credibility of any source that we are exposed to online or in print. And so, um, Get ready to talk about these things in class. All right? I'll see you soon.